we carry on from ayat 47 of Surah Al-Baqarah uh, the preceding ayats we had the first uh, address at the children of Israel as to reminding them of the um, various benefits Allah has given them and that they should act accordingly and challenging them for not doing so and what follows then in quite a lot of ayats so it's actually quite detailed um, is examples of what Allah did and what they did just supporting this whole uh, almost as it were one-way traffic but Allah always extended extra um, allowances and benefits and uh, help for them and they took it for granted and, and, and um, uh, ab abused the privilege um, and the fact that there is so much detail also bears out what we have in ayat 47 namely that Allah has uh, given more attention to them as a people than to probably any other tribe or nation when he says that oh children of Israel remember my blessing with which I favored you that's the same wording as we had earlier but then and that I preferred you over everybody else now okay I say everybody else what Arabic actually says over the worlds yeah I mean we've had that term before and it's in the plural and even so some tafsirs say it only means over any other people at their own time because every people have their own contemporaries as it were so some say um, what he means is he preferred them over all the other nations of their uh, actually time uh, the majority take it further and say no actually he preferred them over all the other nations with the exception of of course what Allah then later describes as the best of nations brought forth for mankind sort of following the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over all the other nations he preferred them uh, because he sent them more prophets than anybody else so he given them more guidance, more miracles, more support yeah um, and, and that preference is not just limited to a particular period of time but it was actually throughout throughout their existence as it were and of course with that kind of privilege uh, comes a responsibility but also interestingly is this um, whole idea of favoritism that uh, whilst everybody and that goes for individuals as much as for let's say nations uh, is um, of equal worth in some respect or equally entitled to develop to their best potential it doesn't mean everybody gets treated the same there is in the creation of Allah a definite hierarchy uh, there is no um, kind of leveling which you get sometimes people argue this, this equality to you know everybody should be treated the same should be having the same should be the same and people take it further even beyond human experience so they come up with animal rights uh, so animals shouldn't be eaten because you know they have rights not to be eaten that they eat each other is a different story then you know uh, that rights are balanced by duties which of course animals can't fulfill and you know the people take this argument right to the extreme the fact is that the divine order is not an egalitarian order it actually is a hierarchical order where different people have different stages and are preferred above others the prophets a lot uh, uh, given peace you know are a much higher category of people than the rest they've been selected for a completely different mission 
So Allah selects some people above others. And the same goes for nations. He selected the children of Israel above other nations with his guidance, with his uh, message, with his help. Uh, the, the, the problem that comes is that, of course, that sort of privilege can, privilege can go to people's head. And it did in their case, because they were favoured, they took it for granted. And as they took it for granted, they became arrogant about it, and consequently lost the entitlement to the favour, because often the privilege is conditional. It's not a birthright. If Allah gives somebody a special favour, it's conditional on being uh, fit for receiving that favour. In other words, uh, comply with the obligations that go along with it. So Allah reminds them again and says, remember my blessing and remember that I preferred you over everybody else. And there comes this, uh, don't think this will help you in the next ayat, in ayat 48, when he says, and beware against a day when no soul will be of benefit to another and no word of support nor any betterment will be accepted from her, meaning from the soul, and they shall not be helped. Um, there are quite a lot of issues in that ayat. Uh, the first one is that Allah's favor to the Israelites will not extend to the hereafter. In the hereafter, they have to answer like anybody else. There is no uh, preferential treatment given to anybody else. To the degree that even the Prophet ﷺ said, nobody will uh, succeed except by Allah's mercy. And they asked him, what even you? He said, even me. So there is no difference in that respect. Um, everybody individually, not as a group, not as a nation, each soul individually will have to answer. That's why Allah makes it clear, it's a day when no soul benefits another. You can't help each other out. You can't tell each other the answers. You can't... Uh, take it off somebody and do it for them. None of that. It all helps. In, in this world it's all possible, you know. People sometimes get to a position by stepping on a path made for them by somebody else, being helped up, being facilitated. Um, people support each other. In the hereafter everybody is for themselves. And then this other one, that, which I've translated as with no word of support, uh, will be accepted. Now actually the term is shafa'a. Shafa'a we usually know as intercession. And it's a quite controversial topic uh, in the sense of, you know, who can intercede for whom or at all. In fact, there have been raging discussions about that. Some reject the concept altogether. Um, the, the, the idea of intercession is that uh, when Allah judges somebody, somebody else, and if we take other ayahs in the Quran, only somebody with whom Allah is content to do so, so He decides who is allowed to speak, Somebody else, and again, uh, that could be amongst the angels, or it could be amongst the prophets, or amongst people, puts in a good word for somebody, in order to uh, help that somebody get a favorable judgment from Allah. And that, of course, uh, come all kinds of possible ideas from that, because Allah's judgment is just, is not swayed by anything, and so not subject to being influenced by anything. That's why it's important that a good word will only be put in if Allah asks for it. 
So the intercession is actually, from that understanding, one that Allah initiates rather than somebody else. So it's almost like Allah calling a witness and say, is there something good you can tell me about that one? Also Allah knows. So there is the possibility of, that's why I say a word of support. Rather than an unmitigated somebody saying, yeah, but you know, he did. No, there's none of that because nobody will speak out of turn. Um, now, in this case, the ayat, even so it's addressed at the children of Israel, deals with the disbelievers or the wrongdoers. Because it says, no word of support will benefit them. It won't benefit them not because it's spoken and ignored, but because it's not forthcoming. Allah will not let anybody speak in their support. Because nobody can put something forward that is inappropriate on a day of judgment. Um, so, so this whole idea of shafa'a, uh, it's, it's controversial also because the, the question then arises, who is entitled to speak in support of somebody? And I don't want to go into that detail. And also who is entitled to receive it? And people say, well, those who don't believe, those who, who, who don't believe in the oneness of Allah, who are uh, uh, believing in other gods, they they out for a start. No chance that they receive any support. But those who are believers but also have done things wrong, and then everybody has, um, of course Allah can forgive them, and He forgives them by letting somebody put a word in that balances out the bad deeds. So, so even so somebody is not the best of practical believers, because they are believers, uh, he lets, let's say, the Prophet ﷺ still say, well, he believed, you know, and he followed those teachings, and you promised that everybody who believes and follows the teachings of the Prophet will ultimately be saved. So there's that idea floating about, that this is what it means. Um, then some say, yeah, but not if any of those sins they may have committed were of yeah. a major, no, beyond shirk, shirk's already out, <laughs> were of any kind of a, a major transgression. Then that doesn't go either. And so there is a lot of discussion, but the, the point is, it's not for us to know. This is something that happens in the hereafter. All we do know is that it exists as a concept that Allah gives permission for some to speak in support of others. And He knows when and why and for whom. Just to know that this concept exists. And of course, furthermore, one has to be careful not to get carried down that road of suddenly doing the, almost the kind of shirk of moving attention from Allah and concentrating on somebody and say, well, do put a good word in for me, you know. Or starting to address uh, people whom we know to be of good conduct and character, you know, starting going to like some people do the graves of uh, well-known Muslim scholars or companions or what, or even prophets and start telling them, well, you know, please. That is, that, that becomes the completely wrong approach because they are not able to do anything unless Allah asks them to or gives them permission to. And then we have this next one about that no, no betterment will be accepted. The term is adl, which uh, in one meaning means justice. Yeah, on the other hand, adl also means um, a, 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 a ransom, something by which you buy yourself free. Um, it's in a way a, a um, a promise of uh, doing something in order to be let off. So betterment here means that if somebody, let's say, has done wrong and he says, give me chance and I'll do this and that. Now, in this life we have many such situations. If we fall short of an expectation or let's say we, we fail a test, we can do a reset. 
Allah makes it clear elsewhere in the Quran that when it comes to judgment day there are no resets. There are people who will say send us back and this time we'll do it right and they say no, you had your chance. And there were people who reminded you as well there is only one go at it. Nobody is going back, it's finished now. Very much like uh, Ali Anhu said that this life is all work and no uh, judgment and the next life is all judgment and no, no deeds, no work. There's nothing you can do about it anymore. You can do a lot here but the result you don't get it. Not until later. But when it comes to dishing out the results you can't act anymore. There's nothing you can do about it anymore. You're at the receiving end of it. So there is no more a chance to say I'll, I'll give it another try. I'll, I'll work harder on it. Let me try it again, let me do it again, uh, give me another chance, there isn't any of that. So, so that won't work. And ultimately, this, this, this categorical, they shall not be helped. Not by anybody. So those who are opposing Allah, those who don't believe in Him, those who transgressed, when it comes to the Day of Judgment, they shall not be helped. There is nobody who could help them. Now back to the children of Israel, because they are addressed by that. Allah says that, and of course this is a statement that doesn't just apply to them, it applies to everybody, but nonetheless it's addressed to them. Why? Because their attitude is being challenged here. Because the Israelites, well familiar or, or, or well aware of the favor that Allah has given them, used to say, we are Allah's special children. He won't punish us. We have that elsewhere in the Quran mentioned this sort of talk. They say, he sent prophets to us. We are descendants of prophets. Yeah, after all, that's what they are. Israel was a prophet. Jacob, yeah, uh, prophet, son of a prophet. We are descendants of prophets. Allah won't punish us. We, we got a license until eternity. We are his special favored people, we can't do any wrong. There is a challenge in this ayah to them saying, on the day of judgment you're going to be judged like everybody else. Yes, Allah favored you, so you would be grateful for it. But on the day of judgment, irrespective of who you are, you're going to be judged like everybody else and if you have become disbelievers or wrongdoers, then nobody can help you. Not your forefathers, not the prophets amongst you, nobody. So it's very important connection here between who is being addressed and what the ayat says. And then comes this catalogue, as I said, of examples where Allah helped them, but they did not show gratitude for it, where He uh, went out of the way to make it better or easier for them and they stubbornly went out of their way to reject or transgress or um, forget about what they should be doing. There comes a litany of examples of that and it's quite interesting how a people can be so are stubbornly and obstinately uh, almost fighting Allah when they have witnessed more than anybody else evidence for his existence and for his involvement. It's, it's, it's very difficult to understand that psyche, that, that relationship. But it's a fact, it exists. It's the arrogance of thinking that you are special, you are favored, and therefore you can get away with anything. So Allah says in Ayat 49, reminding them, taking us back in time, and when we rescued you from the people of Pharaoh who afflicted you with bad punishment, slaughtering your sons and sparing your women, which was a tough test from your Lord for you. 
We'll deal with the detail of that when we come to the story of Musa alayhi salam and the Pharaoh because obviously that's going to be um, discussed in detail in the Quran. Here it's just a reminder and we of course know the uh, summary, the important bits of the story to understand what this is about. Allah reminds them that He rescued them from the people of the Pharaoh. And that rescue was of course a miraculous one. It wasn't just that they got away. They got away because Allah parted the sea for them. And then um, he made the uh, Pharaoh's lot drown, which he mentions in, in the next ayat. And I'll say a few things about that as well. But it was a miraculous rescue. And it was a major relief because it was, after all, after having been subjected to a very tough punishment, to a very bad punishment. And that's what it's called in the Quran, an evil, yeah, bad punishment. The Pharaoh didn't just take advantage of them, he subdued them properly. And when he subdued them, it wasn't just keeping them working hard, it was actually a punishment that, that went as far as, as Allah mentions here, of slaughtering their sons and sparing their women. Because the Pharaoh didn't want them to be strong. And he also feared that, because those prophecies were around that, uh, amongst them a challenger to him would rise, which of course did with Musa salam. He ordered their newborn sons to be killed. But left the girls alone. He yeah, spared them. Uh, and of course for a people that is a very traumatic experience. We're talking about a first mention of genocide as it were. It's a way of, of really subduing a people. Because it's so is indiscriminate. It's not that the odd person who didn't obey orders or didn't work hard enough or something got killed. It's actually a, rans a random uh, indiscriminate killing of a whole generation of people because they could potentially be a threat. So this expresses and sums up the cruelty of the regime under which they had to live and one that they would by their own strength never have got out. But Allah rescued them from it. Yeah. He let them live under that for a time. He said that was a tough test or trial for them. But he did rescue them. As he does promise that he ultimately is with the oppressed people. He doesn't like oppression. And he ultimately helps the oppressed people gain the upper hand. It's part of the rules Allah has made for human society. So he says, and when we, in Ayat 50, and when we split the sea for you and rescued you, but drowned Pharaoh's people whilst you looked on. So the way after, and, and I said I'm not going to go into the detail of the uh, story of Musa and the Pharaoh at this time. And Pharaoh, of course, is a title. It's not a name. And it's not Arabic. And any of the uh, uh, Egyptian and Coptic rulers are called pharaohs. So is that a word in Arabic that's used? Uh? Pharaon, but it's not an Arabic word. It's a it's a it's a foreign word imported into Arabic. Um, now, the only reason the pharaoh let them go 
is because Allah showed them all these miracles yeah, the, the plagues that he sent on them the frogs and the river with blood and you know all these various uh, um, punishments that he um, the locusts and yeah that he sent on on the Egyptians in order to force them to give in to Musa salam. and then even then they went after them and Solar says and when we split the sea for you the only way they escaped was going through the sea and then the sea closed up and the Pharaoh and his people drowned in it whereas the Israelites were on the other side and watched that as well after having had doubt, after having said to Musa alayhi salam, now what? Yeah. What about your Lord? You know, you got us into troubles. We were punished before you came and after you came. You could just caused us more troubles. And Allah still showed them a miracle. So now, they should after that really have no more question or doubt. But they persist as we find out. Now, I just want to transgress a little bit and talk about this sea splitting. Um, I'm not too fussed about how precisely the sea was split because Allah knows and we weren't there. And of course, there people have all kinds of various theories, you know, the wind and this and that, or froze it, or it doesn't interest me. I mean, it is a miracle, it's not a normal occurrence. But there is something interesting um, which has come about, you know, um, some years back where people made some interesting claims that I just want to quickly refer to. And that is a question of where was this sea crossing? And that, of course, has a little bit to do where actually um, did the Israelites go to? And of course we know that they ended up eventually in what is now Palestine. Yeah? And we know that they came from Egypt. Now, the traditional understanding is that they went to the south of Egypt and then crossed over the Gulf of Suez. And from there they go to where is Mount Sinai and then further up north and then they would go round the Gulf of Aqaba towards where is Palestine, yeah? The problem with that kind of interpretation and people have come up with when uh, on, a, on a Bible reading with a different understanding from the descriptions there that may well make sense. Um, the problem with that understanding is that that would have meant that they escaped from Egypt into Egypt. Not much of an achievement, is it? the Israelites escaped from Egypt back into Egypt, what was the point? Seeing that that part where they got to then was also under the control of the Pharaoh and his soldiers. So, the idea that other people have come up with, and I, I only mentioned that in uh, passing, is that they actually uh, crossed at what is known as the Nueva crossing across the Gulf of Aqaba into what is known as Midian which is part of what is now Saudi Arabia which would make sense in some way in that Musa salam, had gone to Midian learned from Shuaib his religion went back to the Pharaoh and it would only have been natural that he took him away into that direction That's yeah because he knew that place now 
people who have explored that possibility um, have come up with the interesting finding that actually at that place, the Nueva crossing near the Gulf of Aqaba, the seabed, well we're not talking about the sea, we're talking almost about the sea estuary, yeah, with this, the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba, yeah, it's, um, that the seabed there is actually raised, so you have like a platform at the bottom of the sea, which means that when the sea level drops, by whatever means, Allah knows that, you have actually a possibility of crossing over. Because anywhere else where you have a very steep seabed, even if the water's gone, how do you get across? If you suddenly have a deep mountain ridge, you have to get down and then get back up a deep mountain ridge. Water or no water is very difficult, isn't it? Uh, so in that place, you do have a very shallow seabed. So you do not have that problem. So if the water is lowered, you still have water on each side, but you actually can get across like a fort almost. And then the water rises again. This, of course, would then place the mountain where Allah spoke to Musa not in Egypt, and now of course you'll get all kinds of complaints, especially from the Egyptians, but it will place it into Saudi <laughs> Arabia, which is the original Holy Land after all. Mm. Now the Saudis don't like that either, just in case I suppose the Jews will lay claim on it, I don't know. Um, whatever reason, yeah, there is interestingly a place there known as Jabal Musa, the mountain of Musa. Mm -hmm. There are other indications, you know, there are some carvings and rocks that uh, are uh, indicative of uh, that time. There is a charred mountain top, you know, which of course we come later to that about the, the uh, lightning or um, that, that, that descends upon the mountain. There are quite a number of indications that that region, and unfortunately it hasn't been very much explored because there is no access much and cooperation. But from what some people have gone and taken some pictures, that, that might well be supportive of that idea that this is what happened. And from there up north they would then move up towards Palestine. So there is that real possibility, Allah knows best, I, I'm not saying this is how it happened, but there is that possibility or that option that actually what we know as the mountain of Musa um, and again whether that is the mountain of Sinai or not whether that mountain is the same is another question because of course the name Mount Sinai has usually been as associated with a mountain in Egypt um, but there is that possibility that actually all that happened on the Arabian side of the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. I thought I, I just mentioned that here when we're talking about the sea being split. Um, there is always, you see, with these things because uh, uh, the Quran is only interested here in the essence of the storyline. The fact that he Allah worked the miracle and helped them escape. The Quran is not a book of history, but of course, as these are nonetheless historic facts, they are not just nice narrative fictitious stories. Uh, it opens up this this whole idea of of researching history and say, well, what actually happened? Where was it? How did it take place? What is left over by way of remnants or evidence? And there is a lot of scope, just like with the uh, Ark of, of, of Noah, salam, you know, where is it, and, and, and so on. There, there are all these issues, and definitely worthwhile exploring if, if uh, uh, one has that possibility. But so I'm just mentioning that. So Allah reminds them of this miraculous rescue and drowning the people of the Pharaoh, and then leads over to that meeting of Musa on the mountain.
yeah, which happens after that. So that's why this is, of course, all all connected and relevant. So he says in Ayat 51, and when we arranged a meeting with Musa for 40 days, well, I say 40 days, it's actually 40 nights in the Quran. But the 40 nights are here meant as a time measurement. And if in English you translate as 40 nights, then people think, yeah, you want to try, read something into that. Why 40 nights? We usually say 40 days. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same. There's no difference. So don't necessarily need an added meaning to it. Simply because the traditional, you know, whether it's Hebrew or Arabic, day starts with sunset. The whole counting of the day is different from hours starting, you know, in the morning at midnight. It's an artificial division to start at midnight, really. Midnight is not a fixed plot, uh, time or something, it's an artificial time. Sunset is a clear time. Yeah, it moves around. Midnight doesn't move around, so for people who want this sort of... Uh, and you find that that th this has been the tendency in, in, in the Christian and, and uh, rather the Roman you know, calendar, because it's not a Christian thing as such. In the Roman calendar, uh, you have this tendency to go for a solar year, because it has the same lengths all the time, uh, to go for fixed time periods, for a fixed day, that can be calculated. Whereas the Islamic, uh, and, and that was the same with the Israelites, and uh, the, the, the day counting was flexible, it went by the moon phases. Each month is of a different, you know, length in, in some way. The year is fluctuates a little bit. Uh, the, the day starts with sunset, which is of course a different time, but it's actually a, a time that you can look at. So it's much more uh, suitable not to city people who want calculations, but to, let's say, nomadic or agricultural people who live with the seasons and with the sun and the moon. You know the months have started because you look at the moon. You don't need a calculator for that. You don't need uh, difficult uh, astronomical equipment. Likewise, if you look at the sun and you know when it sets and you know that's a starting point, you know when it rises. Our prayer times are orientated like that. The beginning and the end of the months is orientated like that. So that's a much more natural, in tune with nature, but an ordinary person who hasn't got any instruments mm -hmm. can easily follow. Whereas the kind of day that we run, you need a watch or a clock or some instruments to be able to calculate your months and because they don't follow the moon phases anymore. They are artificially divided from an artificial year and so on, which of course still follows the sun. So you can't fully divorce it from that. Um, so that's why it says 40 nights, but it's the same as 40 days. Yeah, it's a period of, of time. And it's a period of time that exceeds a month. Um, there is, again, I mean, the, the 40 comes up quite, is, is again an interesting figure. It's a figure that indicates a, a sort of mature period of time, you know, 40 years is sort of when you're meant to be a mature person once you pass 40. Um, a month with its 28 or 29 days, um, 40 is the extra 10. We do that um, uh, for example with Ramadan when we do some extra fasting as if it represents the year and so on. So you go beyond a month. And That sort of 40-day seclusion was 
quite a common practice. So what Musa did here, upon Allah's invitation, he secluded himself from his people for 40 days in order to communicate with Allah. He went for his 40 day retreat. Yeah. That was quite a common practice. I mean, we've had the same as the Prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu retreating to Mount Hira. Yeah. Secluding himself from the people in order to meditate. And this is where he receives his communication from Allah. Musa has done a similar thing here. He goes away from his people. Allah says, when we arranged a meeting with Musa for 40 days, to communicate with Allah, to talk to Allah. And again, we don't go here into detail. The, the children of Israel know all these things that Allah reminds them of. They only mentioned here in brief. But elsewhere later in the Quran, Allah tells us more about it. He tells us more about what happened during that time. What Musa said, what Allah said. But here all that matters, Musa went away for 40 days to devote himself to Allah. And what did his people do? Allah says, you wrongfully took the calf as an idol after he had gone. So the moment he's gone, after all those miracles, after having been preached to by him, after having seen and witnessed the miracles Allah has worked for them, they see other people have idols and say, we want one like that. We want some visible idol that we can dedicate, devote ourselves to, go around in circles. It's fun. So they follow the fashion of the idolaters, the disbelievers. They had no right to do that, as well as says wrongfully. They gathered gold and jewelry and made an idol. Created that idol themselves and suddenly assigned powers to it and said it was a, um, a god. So, after all they have witnessed and seen, they forget about it all. They take Allah for granted and run after what isn't worth it. We have that later with also when they moan about the food they have and that. They run after the things that are minor. Forget the big favors of Allah does them. And they take that golden calf because other people have it and it's a fashion and they say, well, we like it, we want one. And forget totally why Allah rescued them and why he favored them and that after all they were meant to be carriers of his message. In ayat 52 he says, then we forgave you afterwards so that you would be grateful. Even after that Allah forgave them but wants them to be appreciative. Of course again it is a summary reading. The detail is that Musa alayhi salam comes back sees what happens, he challenges Harun, his brother. He challenges Samiri, who was behind the plot. He expels them from the community, he becomes an untouchable. And there is an interesting connection, you know, the cow worship, the untouchables. And the question whether this is where it all originates from. But we'll get into that some of the time when we get to that. Um, but here just the summary Allah says look how ungrateful you were look how wrong you were how he still forgave you how much patience Allah has with you and we move back from that in the next ayat where Allah tells us, and why did Musa, what happened when he went to the mountain? Allah says, and then Musa said to his people, uh, uh, so, and, and when we gave Musa the book, and the distinction so that you would be guided. So what happened on the mountain, 
is that Allah gave revelation to Musa. Yeah? The book, the scripture, in this case the Torah. Or at least part of it. And the distinction, Furqan, a name also given to the Quran, a way of judging between right and wrong. You see, the book is not just a... And, and some say that Furqan here relates to the scripture. The scripture is the Furqan. It's just another name for it. Some say he's been given that personally, the ability to make that judgment in addition to the scripture. So he becomes the one who interprets the scripture, as it were. Um, but the Furqan, that distinction, that criterion... Is, is what helps you to separate the right from the wrong. So Allah gives him a guidance, a scripture, and the power to use it, to apply it to situations amongst his people. So we move on in the storyline, Ayat 54, we told them that after Musa received the scripture he goes back to his people and when Musa said to his people so he now comes back to them and he deals with what they've been doing and when Musa said to his people my people you have wronged yourselves in taking to the calf so repent to your maker and kill yourself, kill yourselves, that is better for you with your Lord, so that he returns to you, he accepts repentance and is merciful. Now there's quite a number of things here in that ayat again. Um, obviously Musa gets back and challenges them and tells them off. We get some more of the direct dialogue later in the Quran when he talks to his brother, when he pulls him by his beard and so on. But he tells them off and says, you've done wrong worshipping that calf, being besotted by that calf. You've done wrong. So what you've got to do is repent to your maker. The word maker, yeah. Um, bari ikum, your maker, yeah. Bari is very much the same as Khaliq, creator. The difference is that Bari indicates the initial first creation. The originator, you could say. Whereas Khaliq indicates the ongoing creation. That is, well, uh, changes one thing to another, you know. Uh, changes the state of things. So he creates life out of death, death out of life, you know. Changes the seasons. Ongoing. Creates new existences, new species, you know, new uh, generations and so on. But, but... Uh, First of all, he made it all once. So there is a subtle difference. It's, it's almost the same, but there is a subtle difference in that term. Uh, so Musa says to his people, you've got to repent. And kill yourselves. Right? Um... According to many commentators, the concept of tawbah, that you can simply repent and be forgiven, is one that is given to the Ummah of Muhammad yeah. as a blessing. But that was not in existence at the time of the earlier Israelite prophets. In fact, the only way you could repent is was to pay the price for it. You could only repent by being punished. 
you were either punished in this life or in the next. And if you weren't punished in this life, then you were punished in the next. Whereas the blessing given to this Ummah is that you can actually, if you repent, be forgiven in this life and not be punished in the next. Be punished neither here nor there because Allah has accepted the repentance. Um, so to avoid the punishment by Allah, this kill yourself means carry out the punishment yourselves. Don't wait for him to strike you down with lightning or whatever. You do it. To appease him, to please him, to, you know, make up for your mischief. And of course, we get into, I, I would almost say speculation again about what exactly happened. Who killed who, you know, which again, uh, for the purpose of understanding what's here in the Quran isn't really that relevant, but, but people do get carried away with that sort of thing. Did the individual wrongdoers who were involved in the creation of the calf kill themselves? Did they kill each other? Did those who didn't follow and warned against it kill those who did it? You know, how many people died? This figure of 7,000 floats around somewhere and all that sort of stuff, you know. Well, don't want to get into it really. But, uh, very, very heated discussions, no doubt, uh, about that amongst uh, uh, people commenting on that, that ayat. But the, the key issue is that at that time, when Musa told them, you've got to make amends, amends meant punishment. You've got to carry out the punishment on those guilty, and you've got to do that yourselves. Otherwise, Allah will do it. So he says, that is better for you with your Lord, so that he returns to you, he accepts repentance and is merciful. So if you do that, Allah will not abandon you totally as a nation. He'll stick with you and guide you again. You've got to eradicate the evil amongst yourselves, and then you are fit for receiving his guidance again. He can accept your repentance. Now, taking that a little bit uh, further, of course, that new concept of repentance that I said applies to the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, is not that much different. It's just less, um, how shall I say, collective. In other words, it's more individualized. You still, if you repent, have to cut out the evil. You have to do that yourself. It's no different in that sense, but rather than saying there is a thousand people and you've got to kill the two hundred who are bad and the rest will still be looked after by Allah, we've moved on to a more individual way of looking at it, at it so that each individual can repent and each individual can cut out the evil deeds or the bad tendencies or whatever you know is wrong in them and then as a person can still get Allah's forgiveness and guidance. So it's not that different in principle if you look at it. The concept is the same. You can only, your repentance to Allah can only be accepted and be valuable if you yourself do something. If you carry on like you did before, that's no good. If you are a habitual thief and you say, oh Allah forgive me, I'm going to steal again do some work, does it? You've got to first of all stop and say, I'm no longer going to steal, now please forgive me for what I've done in the past and make me a better person. Allah says in the Quran elsewhere that it doesn't change the condition of people unless they first change it themselves. So there is still this idea to do with Tawbah, with repentance, that you've got to do something yourself. You've got to cut out and remove the harmful elements in order for the remainder to receive the blessing. The only difference is that now we treat it on an individual level. 
each and every person has to do that directly with Allah. In that way, Islam has emancipated us from collective guilt. Because in those days, you, you, you find that if you read the Bible, Allah would punish whole generations yeah, for their misdeeds. He would wipe out whole people and bless whole people. Almost as if one nation, one family, one tribe was like one person. A very collective approach. Whereas now, each and every one individually can establish their relationship with Allah. And Allah makes it cl clear that, you know, uh, no, bo no soul carries another's burden. And, and, and that is a blessing in itself. But, but so, so even so, this deals specifically with the Israelites. The principle is the same. You want to repent, you've got to do something. You've got to cut out the evil. And then Allah will be able to turn back to you. He accepts repentance and is merciful. And then I had 55, and when you said, O Musa, we shan't believe you until we see Allah clearly. And then the lightning struck you whilst you saw. That is when uh, Musa again wanted to go back to the mountain and communicate with Allah and ask for forgiveness for his people and this time took with him a group of people from uh, the Israelites. He took with him uh, 40 of the elders. Yeah? And, um, or was it 70? I think it was 70. Um, not right sure now, but um, okay. uh, he took with him some of them. And some commentaries on the Quran say that he made them listen to Allah speak to him. You know, Allah spoke to Musa directly here, yeah? that's why his kalim Allah is he's spoken to by Allah. And some say he made them hear it. He took them along to see, you know, the communication, the power of Allah because they were so, you know, they, they, they didn't believe things. They thought maybe this Musa is doing his magic, you know, and... Um, uh, Trying to pull a fast one on us. Yeah, they're always skeptical and, you know. So, he took them also to ask, you know, for guidance, for forgiveness, whatever. And they're stubborn as they are, they again said, yeah, and that's not good enough, we want to see him as well. We won't believe you. Now, if you don't believe a prophet, you reject Allah because he sent him with a message. We won't believe you until we see Allah clearly, visibly in front of us. And of course, you can't. And their demand is different from the one Musa himself. You remember Musa himself had said to Allah on the mountain, and we haven't got that here yet, that uh, I want to see you. Yeah. But that was out of a longing to see him, not out of a doubt whether he exists. And Allah said, you can't see me, but look at the mountain you'll see. And when the lightning struck that mountain and charred it up, you know, the power of it, then Musa realized that he couldn't have handled that kind of power. But here, his people, those selected people who came with him, 
they didn't want to see Allah because they longed to see him they were challenging him they said well show him to us then you know the, as, as if well yeah well if he's so important why doesn't he come and talk to us you know we can see him and it's more of a challenge then it's a challenge and upon that challenge Allah didn't say to them have a look over there you can't handle it he just struck them down with lightning yeah as he says and the lightning struck you whilst you saw so they, they you know they, they witnessed that and then of course we have in ayat 56 then we raised you after your death so that you'll be grateful so Allah after that brings them back to life and says now you've seen the power now please you know appreciate show some gratitude I mean he's really going through some lengths with them but back to ayat 55 for a moment um, There comes the question in the various tafsir about the ability of us to see Allah in the hereafter at least and there are various discussions about that because we can't see him in this world we only see him through his action not as uh, a, a being mm -hmm. we only see the effect of his action we deduce his existence by what he does because things don't happen without having a cause and because they have a cause we deduce that he exists things aren't there without being created um, but in the hereafter the question is can we see Allah, how can we see Allah, who can see Allah and all that yeah um, again I don't want to go into detail because it's really not directly related to the ayat but you can see how uh, tafsir literature very often takes the first opportunity to jump off and discuss other issues that are of interest because there is some even slight connection and of course uh, we have various hadiths that tell us that uh, y you know um, before the hereafter nobody can see Allah except from behind the veil or uh, but that in the hereafter he removes that barrier and that the believers that the greatest reward that we can get is that the believers can look upon him yeah, whereas uh, of course the disbelievers he won't look at them at all but um, that's just by the way so Allah I had 56 raised them again so he struck him down not by way of punishment he struck him down with lightning by way of teaching yeah it again shows how much patience Allah has with these people so when he says how he favored them you can see how he favored them because anybody else I mean he would have just blown them sky high by now but he had a lot of patience with them but that spoiled them I had 57 he says and when we placed you under the shade of a cloud and sent upon you honeydew and quails your manna and salva eat from the good which we have provided for you they did wrong not to us but to themselves so here the reference is to when then they had to go through the desert before they reached what was the land they were promised Palestine after their exodus from uh, Egypt they had to spend their 40 years here there's the 40 again 
in the what is known as the diaspora, in yeah, wilderness. in the wilderness, in the yes, yeah. uh, being away from the settled life, and they had to go through the desert. And of course, there was normally in the desert. What do you get in the desert? No food, no water, no shade. Yeah, that's what the desert is like. It's hot. You travel, you suffer thirst till you get to some sort of oasis, there's nothing, no food, no nothing. But Allah made this journey easy for them. He shaded them by a cloud. He showed them that He is with them by sending them a cloud for shade. He gave them food in a place where there is no food. Honeydew, yeah, manna, which is a sort of a honey, sugary like um, uh, sap of a plant, which is sort of, you know, you, you collect it early in the morning because by the heat of the day it all evaporates, it's gone. So you have to collect it every morning, you can't, it's, you can't store it. And every morning Allah made that available for them, it's um, as, as a sweet. And the quails, or at least most people say that salva is quails, you know, some kind of little birds, you know, like tiny chicken. They, they all say that uh, the quail, they all say it's the quail. Yeah. Most of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some of the ideas around, but but that is the majority, majority view. That of so that quails, is, you know, yeah. tiny little chicken-like birds. Yeah, go to Luton and have some of them. Yeah. That um, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, they, you know, again, had ready-made food there in the desert. So Allah shows how how he favored them and you, you know later we get told that they weren't happy with that they said we can't survive on just the same food all the time mm -hmm. there you go mm -hmm. um, you normally get no food at all in the desert but they go yeah all, always the same and we have something else yeah? and so Allah makes it quite clear uh, that They, when they behaved in that way, didn't harm him, they didn't wrong him, they wronged themselves. Their rejection of these blessings, he didn't wrong them to start with, he gave them everything, and their rejection of this blessing wasn't something where they did him any harm. What they did by their ingratitude is gradually remove those blessings from themselves. And one example of that we get then in the following ayat, and we'll leave that for the next session. Um, but but basically, by by not appreciating what he does for them, by their disobedience constantly, their challenging, and so on, all they did they did harm to themselves because they gradually remove those bless special favors that they had. Allah didn't take that away from them. They did that themselves and they didn't harm Him, they harmed themselves with that. And as I said, there is, and, and, and I think we'll, we'll just take a break and cut it off from here, but there is a lot more examples again of this attitude. And, and it's interesting why um, why does the Quran dwell so much on these examples, on this attitude? I mean, we, we got, a, you know, some two dozen ayats dealing with that, different occasions, different examples. And um, on the one hand, of course, yes, like when we started with ayat 47, it's to reiterate and show how he's given them that special favor how much effort he put in how much he looked after them so that now 
when he turns against them, because he does, they have no more excuse. They can't say, oh, what's the matter with him now? You know, why doesn't he send the prophet to us? Why does he send it to other people? Because that's what they were sent to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, why doesn't he like us anymore or whatever? Then here is your evidence. You weren't worth it anymore because you didn't appreciate it. Mm -hmm. A blessing cannot be taken for granted. Allah even says it to us Muslims. He says, if you turn away, he'll replace you by other people who won't be like you. Mm -hmm. So there is that element. It's a justification of saying why that favor had to come to an end. When did that favor actually stop? Well, with passing on the message to their cousins, yeah, to the Arabs. Mm -hmm. Because if that favor didn't stop, it would become not a positive favoritism, but actually an unjustified one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would become an unreasonable favoritism. It would be something that other people could resent and say, why, after all that, you still mm -hmm. prefer them over everybody else? And, and there is a lesson in that for, again, normal uh, human situations, because uh, we all have people whom we favor. For example, you would probably make much more effort with your own children than you would with a stranger. Yeah? Just take that example. I mean, if a stranger, you know, whom you teach, turns around and doesn't want to learn and isn't bothered and then is rude on top of it, you say, well, I'm not bothered teaching you anymore, get lost, find somebody else. If your own child does that, you say, all right. Give him and you'll try again and say, yeah, well, it's being a bit stupid. Never mind. He'll learn. And you try again. You put so much effort in, you say, I'm not going to waste it all. Well, yeah, okay, I'm not going to kick him now. We'll try again. But then there comes a point where you say, no, I can't do that. Because if I carry on doing that, then actually I favor him just because he's something to me, you know. And I'm doing injustice to others who might deserve much more. So there comes a cut-off point. And Allah is saying that same thing about people. He says, because he sent so much prophets, because they were descendants of a prophet, descendants of somebody, Ibrahim alayhi salam, yeah? Mm -hmm. who was the example of a perfect, uh, obedient slave of Allah, he didn't want to throw all that away because Ibrahim said, my children, yes, what about them? He wanted them blessed, he wanted them to carry on the message. And so Allah did that to a degree, but then he said, well, there is a point, you can't carry on with that. And then he moved it on to another line of his children. Yeah? And so that is important. And that is, that is, we deal so much with it because it tells us why the message had shifted. All these prophets that were sent to them and suddenly that's finished. Given to somebody else. And of course they resented that. And Allah explains here why. Yeah, you resent it, but why? You see why this message had to be given elsewhere? Because you if it was sent to you, you wouldn't have appreciated it. So in that sense it's important. And also, because it tells us a lot about human nature. These are not just character traits of the Israelites, are they? These are character traits that are in each and every one and need to be checked. It's a message to everybody and say, don't be like that. Look what happened. They were like that and look where it got them. Don't be like that. Be grateful. Be appreciative. Allah says elsewhere in the Quran, if you are thankful, He gives you more. But here He has to eventually take it away because He's given so much and it just got spoiled. Be grateful, you get more. Don't get spoiled and arrogant and you lose it all. Because that's what they did. But there is that tendency of taking things for granted. That tendency of getting bored even with the blessing. Like they did with the food. That is in all of us. Because we're so used to it, 
we, we, we don't think it's special anymore. Somebody else would envy us for maybe what we've got and say, well, if only I had that chance. And we look at the Muslims now. I mean, they've got that guidance and treat it like it's worth nothing. Don't appreciate it because they're so accustomed and used to it. We've become, in many ways, like the children of Israel. It's not just that they are like that. Every people have that potential. And because we've become very much like that, we also have lost some of that blessing because it's conditional. That being the best nation is conditional of ordering good, forbidding evil, believing in Allah. If that's not there, then also it gets withdrawn. So there is a message not just to them, but to those who follow them. Don't be like that. You lose it. And so that's why it dwells so much on it, because it's not just history, it's not just looking back. It's actually also looking ahead and say, avoid those pitfalls. And um, yeah, we'll carry on with, with that, uh, with the next session. There is quite a lot more that helps us understand what went on.